Our final speaker this evening will be Donnie Boyd. He's from Klamath Falls, Oregon. He's three generations in agriculture, farming, and, and they had an equipment dealership. And he's also Klamath County Commissioner currently. Um, he's deeply involved in water issues in the basin since 1991. So Donnie Boyd. Thank you everybody for having me. I, I put a PowerPoint together too, but to be real honest with you, after watching these people, a lot of the things I have to say are very relevant. But one thing that is very, very relevant, in, 19, in 1991, Klamath Falls, the Klamath Basin, they, uh, they, they set a level of how much water we had to hold in the lake the upper Klamath Lake for endangered sucker fish. And when Ethan's talking about ESA, it's real. You know, you know, that's what happened to us in 2001. We, did, we went through a drought and the federal government decided that we were not gonna have enough water in that lake to irrigate and support the sucker fish. And we had a complete water shut off in 2001. And I'll tell you what, when they turn your water off, things get real real, real fast. So this is kind of the Klamath Basin in a nutshell. We got six, 6 6.1 million acres of public lands, 90,000 of them are tribal. We have private lands of 3.8 million acres and they support about 2,400 family farms. Of that, the, the upper basin has taken out of that production 26,960 acres. And this is all what we call above the above the project or upper basin. This is above the lake. This is stuff that was taken out before they turned our water off. Knowing that we were gonna have to shut down how many acres have we farmed. This is a picture of the upper basin, the Wood River Ranch, the BLM owns it today. And then this, this dark green here, I'm not in depth with this sucker thing, but the dark blue right here was the the uh, agency lake farms that has been flooded and down at the bottom is the lake when we refer to the upper basin it's everything above the the lake down at the bottom between 2002 and 2006 this is everything that the klamath basin has worked on and received national awards to try to help uh, ir irrigation in, in our project 2002, the federal government came in and put a new fish screen on the A Canal, and that was to protect the endangered the fish. They spent $25 million to do that. They charged the irrigators every single penny of that, plus interest. Then we've come on, on down right here. It says Gone Fishing. I'm sure you guys have all heard of Alan Mickelson. This is one of his pet projects. It's to help recover the sucker fish. Klamath Basin water users, again, have been, uh, oops. the Klamath Basin water users are a very tight-knit group. They pretty much represent all of the irrigators within the Klamath Basin, and they've been awarded some, of, uh, some national awards for trying to help. Then we had what they called up the, the Hatfield group. It's kind of the same kind of things that you guys have got going here. This is collaboration efforts that we tried to do to try to help with the situations. So that's home. This is what the project looked like back in the old days before we started farming it. Tule, we are a Bureau Reclamation project. Unlike you guys, you guys are a Bureau of Indian Affairs project. But this used to be a big lake and it's all been drained off now and is in farmed. And the Upper Klamath Lake is now smaller than it, than it shows here. This is the way it looks today. So you can see the two lakes that have pretty much been gone that we farm. This is a, a, our water usage. The bar, the, the bottom bar down there is how much goes to agriculture. The middle one or the yellow one is how much goes to the wildlife refuges which there is five in the Klamath Basin. And then Iron Gate Dam is the last dam on the Klamath River. There's four dams on the Klamath River and Iron Gate's the last one. And that's how much water goes through Iron Gate. 
Again, this is the annual water user's fault of the volume of water. The, the uh, mouth of the Klamath River is the tallest bar, and then the Klamath Project is the little red one clear down at the bottom. That's how much water the irrigators use. Iron Gate Dam goes is the yellow one, and then the tributaries below the Iron Gate are the green ones, and the subtotal is the darker green. This is one of the biggest problems we have here. When you look at this picture, that seals on the beach at the mouth of the Klamath River, and they are eating a whole lot of our coho salmon that the irrigators in the Klamath Basin are trying to, trying to send enough water down the river to support. The upper basin is 200 miles from the lower basin. They expect us to send the water down that 200 miles to keep that river alive. This here is a picture of it, July 18th, 19, 1918. And the Lake River is just past where we divert our water for the Klamath Project. And they say it's never been dry. That's a picture that proves it is. So what I'm saying is, is today we are sending more water down the river than we have. I've never seen the Lake River dry in my lifetime. I'm 55 years old, but uh, obviously it has been dry there. Those guys are picking the rocks or whatever they're doing. This is fish die off years. This really doesn't mean too much to you guys, but basically it's saying that the lower water years of Klamath Lake, we have better sucker recruitment than years that we do not. That's just another one of those. This is 2001. This is what our farm looked like in 2001 when we got our water shut off. And when I said it gets real, real fast, it does. This is just a couple of the things that we've done. We had a tractor rally, brought this to the Bureau of Reclamation head gates. Kind of an interesting thing, the Bureau of Reclamation is right next to a, a uh, Air Force base. The Air Force got pretty, pretty, wild, pretty wound up. They sent MPs out there to find out why we were coming around their base with tractors. This is more, more of the, the rally, the tractor rally. This is a basically the same exact thing you guys have are going on here. At the time, Kitts Hopper was our governor, and we had over 6,000 people here saying it's not right. We can't shut off farms. Or we can't shut off water in farms. I don't know how many of you have heard about the Klamath Bucket Brigade, but this is where we're dipping water out of Klamath Lake, and technically this is violating the law. We're taking water out of the lake without a water right. We passed it down Main Street, bucket to bucket, there was 18,000 people there. This is the largest congressional hearing outside of Washington, D.C. that was held, held in Klamath Falls to try to solve the problem. That's just more of the Bucket Brigade. Some pictures of some kids that are farmers. We are a project that was pretty much homesteaded between the First World War and the Second World War. There was a few veterans from the Korean War that got homesteads. This is just to make that point. Some more of that. Then in July 4th, 2018 or July 4, 2001, we all climbed over the fence and opened up the head gates. This is what happens when you do that. The federal marshals show up. We're over there on the back with the flags, and of course, you can see the federal marshals with their cop cars and they're armed. ESA were basically saying we needed to amend the ESA, and there was a video for that. This is back to where I'm at. But basically, what I'm here to tell you is I've done it. I have fought to try to save water. We are in no better off than we were in 2001. In fact, we're worse off. The federal government has spent $200 million to update our irrigation projects. We have fancy, we have fancy pivots. We have better irrigation systems now. They've given money to the tribes. They've paid farmers not to farm. But today we are worse off than we were in 2001 before we all started doing what we did. And I think the re we should have settled came up with the Klamath Basin Restoration Agreement in 2001. I don't know, the Klamath Basin Restoration Agreement was a negotiated agreement 
similar to your compact. It died July or December 31st of 2016. And basically we are right back to where we used to be. When I'm saying the upper basin and the lower basin, the upper basin didn't start feeling the pain until adjudication happened and the tribes exercised their water rights, which was more water in the rivers to protect their historical hunting, gathering, and fishing grounds than we had seven out of 10 years. So the upper basin farmed and continued to go on and work and, and make a living farming and ranching until July or until 2013. And now they are, they've cut their production by 60%. The project side, which is the Bureau of Reclamation side, has been able to pump water and keep going. Their, their, their production is down probably about 20. But the point is I have here, is I, like I said earlier, I truly believe that the upper basin, the lower basin, and the Klamath Basin would have been a lot better off if we could have come to an agreement and said, hey, we need to, we need to just settle this deal in, instead of fight. The, uh, I don't know how much I need to get into this, but July 2000, or in July of 2001, when we climbed the fence, I may or may not have been there depending on if you're law enforcement. The real fact is I was there, and uh, <laughs> it didn't get, I mean, we had water for like 30 minutes, and then the cops were there and took it away from us. So it was fun to do. I'm, I'm here to tell you, we, we enjoyed it but it didn't get us anywhere. And so I think the negotiated agreement's where we need to be. That's pretty much all I've got to, got to say. I guess we're gonna have some questions and talk later. Joe, is that with the plan? Donnie, real quick, what has it done to your county's ag statistics, production, that kind of thing? Do a quick for you there. Well, we're 440,000 acres. We produce about $480 million worth of, of uh, commodities. Most of that is beef. Now that's not true. We have about 60% of it is beef cattle. Like I said, the beef cattle is off about 40%. And our irrigated agriculture, potatoes, grain, alfalfa, we raise mint, onions, used to raise sugar beets, that stuff's down around 25 to 30%. The taxes in the Klamath Basin because of that, and as being a county commissioner, that's pretty important because that's how we pay for our law enforcement and our roads and all those things. Our taxes in the Klamath Basin to our general fund is off about 200, excuse me, about $14,200,000. And that's because of value of the ground's gone from dry land, from irrigated agriculture to dry land. This year we had about 160,000 acres dry in, out of that 440,000. That's, that, that's a good question. I'm getting prompted up here. It was what about our lending institutions? The banks, when there is guaranteed water, the banks will loan to the farmers. When there is not, basically our farmers go without operating loans. And so it's pretty tough to get through the year, you know, without an operating loan. You know, and to be honest with you, in 2001, the banks rolled everybody's notes. They moved their land payments notes from the, from the year they were due in 2001, and they put that year to the back end of their note. They haven't done that since 2001, but almost every bank in the Klamath Basin did that in 2001. They didn't want to foreclose on a bunch of ranches without water, I guess. All right, we'll take a break. All right, we'll jump around a little bit here. This question's for Donnie Boyd. When you get water in the Klamath, how much and does it cost? So the Klamath Basin gets 3.5 3 acre feet and we're paying $120 per acre for that water. 
And then if you are in some irrigation districts that have extensive water bill or extensive legal bills because they've been fighting this for as long as they have through the courts or they have pumps that move the water around through the system, there might be charges on top of that. But it's a, basically it's $120 an acre for three and a half acre feet. Just because you pay your O&M of $120, you are not guaranteed to water, but you are uh, obligated to pay that 120 bucks. Do you use three and a half acre feet per acre? It depends on the crop you're raising. There is some crops that require three and a half acre feet. There's plenty that do not. All right, this one, I think Donnie could probably touch on it and expand on it for us. Can anyone address what major impacts to local farmers, local economy would look like if the compact goes through? So if the compact happens, what would you think it out and look for us? Well, I don't know exactly what the compact looks like, but the Klamath Basin Restoration Agreement, basically, the, the, we were gonna be intact. The agriculture was going to farm at about the level it is today. They were asking for about 40,000 more acres out of that 440,000 to come back out. So about 10% more to, to idle ground. One of the things you have to remember about the Klamath Basin is we have highly, highly fertile ground in parts of the basin and ground that is not quite so fertile and that's the ground they would have idled. We refer to it as Class C ground, and that's the ground they would have taken out. So I think the farmers in the Klamath Basin would have maintained, would have been intact, we would have continued our way of life, and uh, the, the Klamath Falls, the city of Klamath Falls would have continued going on pretty much like they are. And I would assume that's pretty much the same way it is here. What is the difference between the compact approach to quantification and the WC approach? Ask Donnie to do Klamath. In Klamath, uh, it's already been decided. Seven out of 10 years, the tribes get 100% of the water for in-stream for in -stream uses so that they can protect their treaty rights and have hunting, gathering, and fishing rights in all the ordinary and custom places. So basically, the tribes end up with 100% of the water seven years out of 10. Who decided that? An administrative law judge decided that. He actually has, he was a psychologist, so I don't think he had any idea what he was really doing, but an administrative law judge made that decision. What is all of this in the Klamath done between neighbors and fellow irrigators and, and that part of the stuff in the neighborhood? You know, that's pretty interesting. I was just literally thinking about that. There's a lot of friends in town today. Or there's people that used to be friends that are no longer friends because they're fighting over water issues, who's getting it, who's not. Uh, so. There's been, in 2001, there was three farmers that committed suicide because they had no way to pay the banks. So it's, it's been pretty devastating today. So uh, it's, uh, it's not the farming community it once was. They're, they're, uh, they're fighting in between the agricultural groups today that never existed until we started down this road. Well, we've tried to answer or ask everybody's questions. I think all the cards have been gone through. Um, I got one for Donnie. I'd like to know how much money has been spent on lawyers and, and that kind of stuff out in your country, or, or is there any of them that they haven't retired? Well, let's say this. Uh, most of the attorneys out in our country are all driving Mercedes Benz or Ferraris or Rolls Royces or something. I honestly don't know how many dollars have been spent. Today, farmers are suing farmers. The Bureau of Reclam works farmers through the Bureau of Reclamation. The Indians, the tribes, Sioux farmers. And one thing that we all have to remember, actually there's a couple things we need to remember. There's only one case where the irrigators have sued the tribes where we, the irrigators won. And actually they didn't even win. It, got, it was down in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. It was down there 
in December, well, it was, it was a couple months ago, Judge Ulrich said, we are going to lower, send this down to a lower court. It's not for me to, to hear this court. So the agricultural community took that as a win, but that's the only one that we've ever won, the, agri the agricultural community that is. And we've been clear to the United States Supreme Court. So there has been several million dollars spent just suing each other back and forth. And it's, you know, everybody's suing everybody. One other thing that we need to remember is every single time a hearing comes out and a judge makes a ruling, it pours concrete around our feet. And the, the more concrete we get poured around our feet, the less we can maneuver. So the more you sue somebody, the more, the more hearings that come out, the less opportunity you have to come to an agreement. I think that's a pretty important statement. To remember that the, the more this happens, the less opportunity you have to come to an equitable agreement or settlement. And this is kind of a cliche statement, but I think we need to remember that we would rather be at the table negotiating than being on the menu. All right, I think um, that winds up all the questions, written questions. I want to thank all three presenters for coming. Um, this was designed as an educational. Um, hopefully you guys, everybody learned something out of it or got some questions answered. And thanks again from the Flathead Irrigation District.